the story you are about to hear is true, only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to juvenile bureau. A pair of fake talent scouts are at work in your city. They're victims, young girls seeking careers in Hollywood. The criminals are real vicious and relentless. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, May 7th. It was mild in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Inspector Bowling, Commander, Juvenile Division. My name's Friday. It was 10.13 a.m. when I got to 1335 Georgia Street, second floor. The squad room. Hi. Hi, Ben. Did you pick up that latest run the staff's office made for? No, I don't think they got it ready yet. Notice there in the book, it's been ready since yesterday. You were over there, you could have picked it up. Oh, yeah. What's the matter with you this morning? Don't you feel good? No, just this stinking cold seems to be settling in my chest. Miserable. Yes, sir? Can I help you? Oh, yes. I'd like some information, please. This is the juvenile bureau, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, sir. What can we do for you? Oh, mind if I sit down at climbing those stairs? Takes your breath away. Yeah, sure. Here you are. Thank you. My name's Wayne Kenworthy. The officers are out here on a convention. My home is in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Went out last night with some of the boys at the convention. We stopped at a bar uh, down on your Alvarado Street. Uh, Alvarado. Yeah, Alvarado. Anyway, we were drinking there, and the bartender got to talking to us. Finally offered us some pictures for sale. I got one of them right here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. yeah there you are. I paid him two dollars for it. Just look at that. Filth. Do you have the address of the bar where you bought this? Yes, sir, I have. But that's not the reason I'm here, though. I'm not a one-man moral squad. I'm not the type that makes a habit of buying obscene photographs of young girls, either. Yes, sir, we understand. And I bought this picture from that bartender because I know the young girl in it. She's the daughter of one of my neighbors back home in Minnesota. Known her ever since she was a baby. Let's see. This girl came out here about eight months ago to live with a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. She was crazy for Hollywood, thought she might break into the movies or something. She stopped writing her folks about two months ago, hasn't been heard from since. Well, it sounds like a case for a missing persons bureau, Mr. Kenway. Well, the girl's folks have already contacted them. Nothing's been turned up. Nothing at all. Then, last night, just by an accident, the bartender shows me this photograph. It's that girl, all right, no mistake. Mm. Well, we'll do everything we can to help straighten it out, sir. Well, that young girl I know. I've known her since she was a baby. Good family, good training. She never would have posed for a photograph like this. Rotten filth. She's just not the type, that's all. Yes, sir, we understand. What was this young girl's name, Mr. Kenworthy? Lois Brewster, that's her real name. Well, she wrote her folks she was using another name while she was out here. Thought it might help her movie chances. Drake, I think that's what it was. Linda Drake? Yeah, that's right. About uh, five foot four, 115 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes. That's right. Yeah. You know where she is? Well, yeah, we do. We had her case called to our attention. Hmm. Where is she? Is she all right? No, sir. She's dead. Two days before Mr. Kenworthy walked into Juvenile Bureau, the body of a young girl had been washed up on the shore just below the beach town of Venice. Apparently, she'd taken her own life. The girl was a brunette, attractive, not more than 17 years old. There was no identification on the body except for a rent receipt found in one of the pockets of a cotton jacket that the girl had been wearing. The rent receipt was made out to Linda Drake, 
It was signed R.L. King, 876 Peoria Avenue. The address was checked out, and R.L. King was found to be the girl's landlady. After identifying the body, she told investigating officers that Lois Brewster, alias Linda Drake, had lived at her rooming house with a girlfriend for about six months. The girlfriend's name was Joyce Fowler. The landlady went on to explain that the two girls had moved out about a week before without leaving a forwarding address. The Fowler girl had said that she would call back for any mail that might be delivered to the Peoria Avenue address. There had been no other leads to the dead girl's background or identity until her former neighbor from Minnesota, Mr. Wayne Kenworthy, showed up. Later that day, Ben and I met with Inspector Bowling and briefed him. Dirty, rotten business. I'll buy that. How far have you gotten with it? Check the dead girl's prints with the missing persons, Bolton. This Lois Brewster. We notified the girl's parents in Minnesota. They're coming out to claim the body. It's pretty tragic. She's an only daughter. Seventeen years old. Same old story we figure, Skipper. Some phony talent scout grabbed her and showed her the bright lights, got her to post for those pictures one way or another. They can make a teenage girl go one of a hundred directions after that. Ah, this one ended up on a beach. That's all I care about now. How about the girlfriend Lois Brewster was living with? Joyce Fowler? Mm, There's no word so far. Mm. Well, what about it? Any ideas? Well, it pretty much depends on finding this Joyce Fowler. There's no background on her. We got out on all points. How about phony talent scouts? Cheap modeling schools, photographers? Check out that angle. We put four of them away in the past six months. Another half dozen are being watched. We can start double-checking them tomorrow. Now, how about that picture that old fellow Kenworthy brought in? Any lead there? We gathered a dozen samples just like it. One's as bad as the other. They're all printed on the same quality photographic paper. There's no markings of any kind on them. It's a common type of paper. All right, then get on the distribution angle. Stay on it. Every rotten bum that peddles this trash, you get them. I want them right up the line. Distributors, wholesalers, guy that prints the pictures, guy that takes them every lousy one of them. I still can't figure. What's that? Well, the Brewster girl is a good home there, good training. She knew right from wrong. Kids don't forget that in a hurry. That might have been her trouble. Well, how do you mean? She remembered it. Wednesday, May 8th. Six teams of men from Juvenile Division working in conjunction with the Detective Bureau started the drive against the obscene literature and photography traffic. Within two weeks, more than a dozen wholesalers, distributors, and small-time peddlers had been apprehended and were awaiting prosecution. But we still had failed to uncover any new leads in the Lois Brewster case. The roommate, Joyce Fowler, the all-important witness in the case, was still missing. No trace of her. The dead girl's parents arrived in the city, claimed the body, and took it back to Minnesota for burial. The drive continued. Another week passed. On May 29th, on a tip from a usually reliable informant, Ben and I checked out a small photographic studio on Sunset Boulevard, operated by an Emil Joseph Martin. He was sullen and uncooperative. We checked through his files. Just what I told you. A few special shots I keep filed away just for that. Okay. Once in a while, a friend drops in. I print one of them up for him. Yeah. Hold that one up to the light. Some of them are nice-looking dolls, huh? I print one up for my friends once in a while. What kind of friends do you have? Huh? How about this negative here, Martin? Do you mind printing this one up for us now? Sure, officer. My compliments. How many copies do you want? One's enough. If you say so. Let's see. Ah, uh, one of the best. I'll print it up right now. This way. This one's a real collector's item, you know. Yeah, right. A friend of mine got me the negative. hundred bucks it cost me. Worth it, though. I'll make up a couple of prints for you, huh? One's good. Okay, anything you say. You want to get that light switch? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. It's a good one, all right. Yeah. There's the paper in here. Yeah, that does it. Okay, one print. That's all you want? That's all. Yeah, 
Okay, let's put it in the soup. Yeah, I bet you get a kick out of this one. Real beautiful girl. How'd you happen to get a hold of this negative? You take the picture? No, a friend of mine got it for me. Cost me a C-note. There you go. Put it in the stopper. There we go. Uh-huh. How about that? How about the guy you got this negative from? Did he take the picture? No, he bought it from somebody else. Don't know who. Cost him 350 Worth it, though, huh? you understand I didn't take the picture. I just bought a negative, that's all. You couldn't tag me for that, could you? We're going to try, mister. Get your coat. Oh, no. Wait a minute now, officers. I'm small fry in this operation. You know that. You want the big fish, right? We want all of it. You know who they are? Well, some, maybe. Must be worth something to you. Well, you know better than that, Martin. If you cooperate, we'll mention it in our report. That's all we can do. No promises. Not a very good offer. You're not in a very good position. Yeah. Bye. All right, I'll tell you. Emil J. Martin was booked at city jail for violation of 311 PC. His file of lewd photographs and negatives were impounded and booked as evidence. With the help of information which the suspect had given us, we were able to round up three wholesalers and another distributor of obscene books and photographs. Each one of them was questioned thoroughly. We ran into the same old routine. They denied knowing anything about the man who was masterminding the racket or where he was operating from. The Lois Brewster case dragged on. No progress. In virtually every case of tracing the lewd pictures to the point of production, the investigating officers were able to link the small-time peddlers to their distributor and the distributor to the wholesaler. Well, that's where it stopped, a dead end. Beyond that, nobody knew anything about the operation of the racket. Stakeouts were set up at locations where sales and deliveries of obscene material were known to have been made. Nothing happened. The drive stalled. Thursday, June 11th. Come out, Joe. Yes, Gibber? First piece of news in the month. Policewoman just called it in. Yeah? Lois Bruce's girlfriend, Joyce Fowler. Yeah? She's been found. are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Like most organized crime, the traffic in obscene literature and photographs is a racket jealously guarded because of its heavy profit. It's nationwide and every year it nets millions of dollars for underworld promoters and their employees. As an organized business, it's one of the most vicious and insidious rackets that exists today, despite the fact that many citizens regard it lightly. Thursday, June 11th, 10 a.m., Ben and I met with policewoman Paula Johnson. She told us that the previous evening, Joyce Fowler, the girl Lois Brewster had been living with, had gotten into a brawl with an unidentified man at a bar on Sunset Boulevard. Police officers arriving at the scene identified her as the missing girl and handed her over to juvenile authorities. At 10.30 a.m., Joyce Fowler was brought to the interrogation room. She was a tall brunette, fairly attractive. She looked older than her age. Together with policewoman Paula Johnson, Ben and I questioned her. I was out on a date with this man. We were sitting at the bar, and he started saying things I didn't like. What a row, that's all. The man seemed quite a bit older than you, Joyce. Was he a good friend of yours? A friend. He was about 50, I guess. I thought he was all right. He wasn't. How old are you, Joyce? 21. You checked your background, Joyce. You might as well tell the truth. All right, I'm 17. I'll be 18 next week. Look, can't I go get an aspirin? I've got a terrible headache. I got some in my locker. You're right, Ben. Okay. I still don't know why I'm here. What do you want to know? Well, you were a good friend of Lois Brewster's. You lived with her. Is that right? Is that why I'm here? It's one of the reasons. Lois spent eight months out here before her death. As far as these officers know, you lived with her during those eight months. We want to find out what happened to her. We want to find out what's happening to you. Nothing's happening to me. I can take care of myself. 
That's what Lois Brewster thought, Joyce. How about it? Can you tell us? She didn't know what she was doing. I don't know what happened to her. I'm to blame for bringing her out here, but it's not my fault what happened to her. It's not my fault. Well, whose fault is it? All of them. The whole rotten, dirty bunch of them. Here's your aspirin. Would two of them be enough? Thanks. I'll get some more. Mm. There's something wrong, Trice. Don't you feel well? I'll be all right. All right, here you are. I don't remember too well how it started. Lois came out to Hollywood to live with me for six months, you know. Yeah, we know. We tried to get modeling jobs, bit parts in the movies. We didn't have much luck. We had to eat, pay the rent. So we took jobs as waitresses at a drive-in place out on Santa Monica Boulevard. Are you still working there? No, we were only there two weeks and we got this other job. That's when it started. What was that? One day, these two men drove in with a brand new Cadillac, ordered a couple of Cokes. I could tell they were watching us, Lois and me. When they were leaving, they gave me a card. They said they were talent scouts. They asked us to come to their offices for interviews. You still have the card they gave you? No, I looked for it once. Guess I lost it. Mm -hmm. Would you go on, please? The older fellow's name was Fred Ramos. Other one was Mr. Gilbert. They were both very nice. We didn't think anything was wrong. Didn't you go for the interview? Yes, Lois and I both went. They talked to us a lot, had us read out of a script and walk up and down. They said both of us showed a lot of promise. They said they wanted to be our agents, so we signed a paper. Fred Ramos told us he'd see we got a break. Mm -hmm. Did either of them ever arrange any legitimate interviews for you? I mean, with the movie studios, radio, television, anything like that? No. They took us out quite a bit, restaurants, nightclubs told us we had to be seen around town first. Had to show us off to the producers, all the important movie people. Both of them were very nice. And did you keep on working at the drive-in? No, they had me and Lois quit the job. They said it wouldn't look right. We still had to eat. We still had to pay our rent. That's when they brought up the idea of the pictures. What pictures do you mean, Joyce? I'm sorry. Could I have some more water, please? Oh, yeah? Fred Ramis and Mr. Gilbert took us out to a big nightclub one night. Fred told us that if Lois and I had some good pictures taken of ourselves, he could show them around and get us jobs as models. That is, till we got a break in the movies. Here we are. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Up to that time, how long had you known these two men? About, about a month and a half. I didn't see anything wrong in it, so Lois and I went to this photographer's studio with Mr. Ramis, and we had our portraits taken, regular pictures. Oh, excuse me, Joyce. Did both of these men know how old your girls were? We told them the truth. We were both 17. Mm hmm And what happened after that? Mr. Ramos came back and said he'd found an advertising agency that wanted to buy pictures of Lois and me. He said we'd get $20 a piece every time we posed. For portraits? No, for posing in bathing suits, pajamas, things like that. They were supposed to be for magazine ads. In about a week, he brought us to his office and said the agency wanted us to pose without clothes, without anything. He said he'd pay us $40 for that. Well, go on, George. They showed us lots of pictures of models like that. They talked about it all the time. We kept saying no, both of us, Lois and I. Did you ever agree to pose for the kind of pictures they wanted? You can't agree to something you don't know about. I don't know how it happened, but it did. Mr. Gilbert and Fred Ramos, they kept taking us out. We used to drink quite a bit with them. Went on for weeks, I guess. One night there was a big party. We drank. Lois and I got separated. I still don't know what happened. I see. Next morning we both woke up with headaches. Fred Ramos came and showed us the pictures. I felt dirty all over. I don't know how it happened, I swear it. Lois began to cry. I hit Mr. Ramos. I slapped him. Well, what does Mr. Ramos tell you? He pretended to be very nice about it. Said he'd pay us well if we'd go on posing for pictures. The kind he wanted. If we didn't, he said he'd 
Breck any chance we might have in Hollywood. Said he'd see that the pictures got out. Threatened to send copies to our families, our friends back home. Didn't you think of going to the police? We talked about it. We were afraid of the publicity, the newspapers. We just kept going on, doing what he said. It's like a nightmare. Kept getting worse, we kept getting in deeper. Sir, did you have that envelope? Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You recognize these pictures, Joyce? Yes. Mr. Ramos and Mr. Gilbert, they have you posed for these? Yes, that's some of them. We always drank a lot so we wouldn't remember. That's that's not why Lois is dead, though. Those pictures aren't the reason. Well, how do you mean, Joyce? Ramos and Gilbert, they'd fix up dates for us. They said the men were their friends. Three or four times a week they'd call. We had to go out with them. We had to do what they said. Hmm. One morning we got home about 5.30 in the morning. Lois changed, said she was going for a walk. I went to bed. She left a note. I never saw her again. Mm -hmm. I see. Romero? Oh, yeah, just a minute. That long-distance call we placed to your home, Joy. Sure. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah, it's me, Joyce. Yeah, it was just a mistake. Yeah. How's Uncle Henry? Swell. No, no, it's all right. Don't you worry. Yeah, all right. I'll write you tomorrow. Yeah, bye. Thanks for placing the call, Sergeant. You're welcome. Glad to do it. Anything else you want to know? Yeah, there's just one more thing. Do you still have that note that Lois Brewster wrote before she died? No, I lost it. I remember what it said, though. Yeah. It said, I'm sorry. It was signed Lois. That's all. Joyce Fowler supplied us with the addresses of Fred Ramos and his partner, Gilbert. She gave us all the names and addresses of all their friends and employees that she knew of. She also pointed out their offices and base of operations. Inspector Bowling ordered an immediate investigation into the background and business activities of both men. Previously convicted wholesalers and distributors of obscene photographs were called back in and re-questioned. We finally completed the missing link in the supply line from the peddler to the producer. Five former workers for Ramos and Gilbert fingered them as head men controlling the racket. Their offices and studios were raided and their files seized as evidence. On June 18th, Fred Ramos and his partner, Harold Gilbert, were placed under arrest. What's the pitch, Sergeant? What's this all about? I think you know, Mr. Ramos. Oh, you can't tag me on those pictures. You want to get your hat? It's artwork, legitimate artwork. My lawyer can prove that. He better be good. He better he is. You know, I'm kind of surprised at you cops taking a word of somebody like that Fowler girl. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's a psycho. Good right. Why, well, sure. I, I tried to do something with her and that girlfriend of hers. I even signed up as our agent. They were hopeless. You've got quite a stack of negatives here. Pictures of both of them, 17-year-olds. Ah, they're just candid shots, you know. Spicy for my private collection. There's nothing wrong in that. I figured I'd give the girls a break, let them earn a few bucks. Yeah. Look, I couldn't have treated those girls better. I took them around and showed them the town. Both psychos. I never did trust them. Well, that's the big difference, Remus. Huh? They trusted you. Fred Ramos and Harold Gilbert were brought downtown to Inspector Bowling's office. Joyce Fowler was seated next to the desk. Gilbert was brought in. She identified him. He was taken out and held for booking. All right, bring in the next one. All right, come on. Yeah? Can you identify this man, Miss Fowler? Yes. He's Fred Ramos. What's the trouble, Joyce? Weren't you satisfied with what I was paying you? Could have settled this between ourselves. If you had any beef, you could have come to me. You're lucky, Fred. I'd kill you now if I could. Oh, Joyce, oh, come on now. Crazy. Sit down. All right, Sloan, take him out. Joyce, sit down. Come on. Sit down. Be back in a minute, Joe. All right. I'm sorry. Doesn't do any good. Are there any more? No, that's about all. You've helped quite a lot. Yeah, I'm glad I could do it. 
that all, Sergeant? Well, for now, yeah. You'll have to testify at the trial. After that, the juvenile court's going to keep in pretty close touch with you. I see. Aren't you going back home, Joyce, to Minnesota? No, it'd be the same old thing. My aunt would be glad to see me for the first week. And she'd start all over again, hollering at me, picking. Wouldn't be any use. What are you going to do out here, Joy? You know? I know a nice fellow in Santa Monica. He's going to get me a job at a brand new drive-in. Cute uniforms. Uh-huh. Well, I don't think juvenile court's going to let you take a job like that, Joyce. Well, I hope so. A lot of talent scouts go there. Radio, movie producers. They might notice me. Yeah. You can tell. Might lead to something. The story you've just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 4th, the trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. <laughs> Fred Ramos and Harold Gilbert were tried and convicted on several counts of rape and lewd conduct. They received sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Coming up, we the people with stories.